welcome to the Earthworks Podcast, where our team will share the jargon of carbon from many of our turf friends from the past 30 years. Hey, everybody. Uh, Kevin Hicks with Earthworks, and we've got another podcast uh, this morning. Um, I'm lucky enough to have Benton Hodges on, and he's now with Mountain West Turf Technologies. And um, this one's a little out of my comfort zone, my friend. So uh, you're going to have to bear with me. I'm I'm uh, I, I'm diving into this. It's interesting to me, but I don't understand any of what you're doing. So I really want to kind of kind of get uh, some of your background. Um, uh and uh and kind of how you got to where you are now but uh the the technology thing isn't going away and i think you're you're really on to something um mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm interested to see what what you're into right now and, and you know kind of where you see the future and in, in turf management so we'll start with that benton hodges cool. uh, thanks for joining yep. me um Tell us about yourself. You you gave me a little history when we when we first talked a couple of weeks ago, and um, yeah, I can kind of give a quick spiel. Yeah, let's do that. How I ended up in turf and everything. Um, grew up in Tennessee uh, to probably the only two non golfing dentists in uh, in America. So I, I really wasn't introduced into the game until college. One of my friends worked at a golf course, and I was home for a summer, and he invited me over to play on maintenance Monday. I'm sure we were the annoying college kids that. Yeah. The superintendent was was cursing, but it's what got me hooked. Um, and as I finished up college at Alabama, I finished with a biology degree. I thought I wanted to be a dentist like the parents, but they kind of talked me out of it. They're like, you know, if you want to do it, you should do it. But um, we did it. You don't necessarily need to follow those steps. So sure. kind of left me in a in a daze of what should I do? I, I finished with a biology degree, but I had taken a few plant biology classes in the upper level and I was working in a a lab one summer and um for d extracting dna from red and green algae and uh, i had a really interesting quirky professor who kind of turned into an advisor and he kind of just was like what are you going to do after you graduate with a biology degree <laughs> yeah. and i i didn't know and he was like you know you seem to have a little bit of a knack and want to research and stuff like find something you like researching and so i just remember sitting down at a, a computer in that lab and somehow ending up on auburn's turf grass website you know I, it wheels started turning i was like grass is a plant i like to play golf maybe people research golf course grass and mm -hmm. so i sent a few emails to auburn mississippi state and tennessee and a few months later i had a fully funded assistantship at mississippi state studying uh shade on bermuda grass putting greens okay. um so it was really cool and i you know i learned a lot but i felt like an imposter when i was in grad school because i just i was intimidated by a fairway mower i I couldn't mow a laser straight line on the walk mower. You know, all these undergrads seem to be much more with it as far as how to manage a golf course and just getting it kind of thing. I, I think my my professor was a little frustrated with me not being in turf because I I just couldn't pick up when an irrigation head was off on my putting green. I just didn't right. have that that eye. So I finished up. I, I I did fine in it and stuff and and learned a lot. But I knew I wanted to get on a course and no better way than an internship, you know? So I, sure. my first year in grad school, I remember just always looking at the internships and getting so excited because there's golf courses everywhere. So I just made a big spreadsheet and I listed all the internships. So before they even posted them the next year, I just started emailing places and had a few interviews. I knew I wanted to move West and lined up some interviews at Denver Country Club, Cherry Hills, and um, Broadmoor with uh, Zach Bauer. He's up mm -hmm. your way now. Yep. Um, <laughs> Ended up taking Denver Country Club, did an internship there for a year and quickly got a lot of experience that I was lacking, um, but kind of knew I wanted to move west up into the mountains more away from the city. So yeah, spent a winter in Breckenridge, uh, skiing around, being a ski bum in a ski shop, and then uh, took a job in Steamboat Springs at a really cool property called Windwalker Ranch. It was oh, uh, yeah. built by Billy Payne and 12 of his friends from Augusta, like little, little Augusta, basically, they draw dates for a timeshare and they come out and so they had originally tried to join the the other private club in town as a, a shared membership but nobody wanted to work together so they just built their own little golf course amenity they <laughs> called it Except we had seven putting greens 25 acres of maintained turf i i could go spray greens at, at sunset kind of thing it, so oh, it was wow. sweet but it still wasn't quite a real golf course kind of thing so yeah i i was working at a ski shop in the winter and my, my boss was kind of shot me straight he's like you know Maybe this turns into a year round. We don't have a lot going on in the winter. Um, but if you see something that interests you, you should, you should apply for it kind of thing. 
because I was kind of ready for that next step of of being year round, having the benefits. Not so you're chasing, finished with your the tail of it. Yeah, so you're finished with your master's at this point, or no? Yeah, yeah, I had you finished had, in okay. two years before the internship. Yeah, like I did it pretty quick. Um, was able to get in and get out. Um, and yeah, so I spent two years at Windwalker or two summers at Windwalker Ranch, saw it be built, and then spent the next summer. And then that winter, I saw a job posting up in Jackson. That was kind of the next step. And that was at Shooting yeah. Star. Yeah. Um, and that's where I spent my last six seasons um, before kind of stepping down in November to j- kind of find a new direction. I was going to propose to the fiance. We were moving to the Idaho side. So kind of time to just reevaluate and see what I wanted to do with life. Um, and yeah, I, I originally was kind of thinking of getting out of the turf industry, but I saw a few job postings from Greenkeeper and USJ Deacon. And that's what kind of sparked the the thought of it's not just selling big equipment or being a superintendent. There's some like different avenues sure. maybe out there this year um, uh, or th- s- at this time. And scary jump for you. Go ahead. I, I, I mean, I mean, it was, you know, um, at first it was kind of gradual. So okay, it's a great course and I, I loved it, you know, and um, you know, I think both me and my, my former bosses would probably admit we had different management techniques and I yeah. think we had both just kind of, reached a mutual parting of ways kind of thing. I gave them, you know, I, I made sure I really set them up for success because I, there had been a few years where I had thought about leaving, but I really wanted to, to leave it in good shape and, and like fill out that upper management before I left. Cause it used to just be me and the super and the director of agronomy pretty much, but we finally kind of filled it out. I, I felt more comfortable leaving at the time and it just felt right. But it was scary at first. My, my fiance, now fiance is super supportive. She's the planning director for Cheetown County, Idaho. So she has a pretty nice real job. So she, I knew that was that and she was very supportive of it. And that's kind of what gave me the encouragement to, uh, to pop the question once she was supportive when I said I was going (laughs) to resign. I was like, okay. (laughs) So she seems to really like me. She's not in it just because I'm the (laughs) guy shooting stuff. Now Um, is she an Idaho gal or, or, or from your, she's from Minnesota. She's from Minnesota originally. And then she was living down in Boulder and we just met through kind of climbing circles. Um, and moved her up there um so yeah it was, it was kind of scary at first at first like i said i was kind of just trying to get out of turf or just look at other ways kind of thing and yeah then i saw those two jobs and that kind of got me thinking put together good materials but you know they just went another direction and that was like right around before the phoenix show and that's when i was like okay like let me look up all these other tech companies or companies that might basically i was kind of looking for something remote you know to yeah. be able to still live yeah where I want, but not necessarily be tied to a golf course kind of thing. Um, just to more mesh with me and my fiance's lifestyle. You know, I, I'm a big climber and skier and she is too. And when I first moved out to Jackson, it was a lot easier as a single guy to kind of juggle the assistant schedule and still get out in the mountains. Right. But then I got, you know, friends that had hard schedules and then the fiance. So that was definitely a lot of it and that's why she supported and she's able to work, work remote. So I was, you know, if I could find something that had a little flexibility, we could maybe have a pretty cool lifestyle. And so that's when I really started looking at all these different companies before the Phoenix show. And originally I was reaching out and being like, Hey, you want to hire me kind of thing at first. But the more I talked, cause I was really focusing in on kind of the superintendent owned and started tech companies, playbooks for golf. Matt Leverich was one of the first guys that actually mm-hmm. responded. And, you know, I kind of figured out that these little smaller ones were a lot more like, to, to talk to me kind of thing yeah but they weren't necessarily looking to hire employees kind of thing so it became apparent as these companies needed people spreading the word not necessarily working under them developing the tech kind of yeah. thing especially since i have the turf background i'm not a, a coder or a, a computer guy I'm, I'm tech savvy for sure but sure i can't do much beyond websites um so yeah that's when i just kind of slowly started i'd talk to one partner and they'd tell me somebody else and Kind of just assembled some partners on different structures of either pure referral fees kind of thing or, you know, but what really stuck out at Phoenix, I guess, was the the robotic mowers. You know, that's kind of what I envision is like the flashy thing that can get me in the door. And yeah, so yeah, the, I, pretty much since the show, I've just been talking to whoever will talk to me, whether it's a potential partner or just supers that are interested in tech or companies that just want to talk and see what I'm doing. So yeah, kind of. I real I, I felt like I was a really with it assistant, but when you're on a court, you just don't have that time to like right. truly dive deep. You know, right. you see something you're like, that looks cool, but I'm not gonna go call them and spend hours clicking every link on their website. But when I have nothing else to do, I can, I can spend that time. <laughs> so so I've definitely like 
realized I've really amassed this this kind of knowledge and just talking to different companies and kind of that's when it kind of started hitting me. I Landscapes Unlimited reached out to me whenever I posted my resume on Twitter, and I think they were kind of looking to hire me as a construction superintendent. We talked and realized that wasn't going to work, but they took put me in touch with their director of technology, and we just had a talk and his view because he he was kind of in the golf realm a little bit but he was much more of a tech guy and like the way he was saying and that's when it really opened my mind to the future of like wow and in 25 years this could be a whole like ecosystem of technology of the drone creating the map for the variable rate sprayer and all that and that's when i kind of started latching on to that idea of what what's turf going to look like in 2050 you know i think it's kind of catchy with 2025 coming up where have we been since 2000? Where are we now? And what's it going to look like in 2025 oh, kind of thing? So you fed perfectly into my bullet points because that's kind of one of my <laughs> last questions. Is, you know, after we, we frame this whole thing, I want to I want to kind of get your yeah. feel as to what, you know, what we should be focused on as as turf managers. So yeah, totally. So, and I mean, yeah, that's kind of the long and the short <clears throat> of how I ended up here. So, so you're um, primarily working off of referral type of type of compensation yeah and that's or... kind of, you know it's yeah and that's been some of the funny part because you know these businesses start asking me all these different terms and structures and i'm like guys i i'm gonna i'll be open and honest and transparent because that's just who right. i am kind of thing like I, i'm new to this so like you tell me what you've done previously i feel like this is all kind of new for for all of us kind of thing so yeah i mean i think there's some where i think it'll be just referral you know like playbooks he told me if they're interested give them my number and i'll finish it from there kind of thing okay but you know with the robotic mowers that's when i'm like i think i could also be the installer and service provider in my region as well kind of thing so kind of trying to figure out where exactly i fall honestly or, or how i'm going to turn this into to money <laughs> basically yeah you know? and, you, and you you say on your on your um on your twitter twitter bio um, I assume you've got a website i haven't investigated yeah. a whole lot but uh, on that bio you say that you serve Montana, Wyoming, Idaho. Mm-hmm. Were there others? No, and I mean, you know, some of it is I, I'm open to talking to anybody <clears throat> from any course, but I think I also, you know, I really resonate with the Mountain West and ski towns, and and I kind of notice that there's just not a lot of representation either for okay. those golf sure. courses. Yeah, you know? that makes sense. It's just further away. You know, we didn't always get to see the flashy demos kind of thing, so. Yep it might take five extra years once we finally start seeing GPS sprayers or whatever, you know, five years ago, it took, right. kind of takes a while. And so kind of realizing that as well, once I talked to these companies that they're like, yeah, we don't really have anybody that's talked to, I know there's golf courses out there and pretty high budget ones. I'm like, Oh yeah, yeah there are. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, that's kind of why I started focusing on the mountain West. But like, I mean, again, yeah, like, especially in the winter when we're under snow, I'm definitely open to being more of that consultant to, to anybody anywhere if they just want to talk but yeah that kind of limits it on that service provider side so that's why i'm kind of focusing on idaho montana and wyoming but i think i have it even listed and beyond the kind of thing so yeah i think um, i think you know if you, if you get some traction you're going to be <laughs> you're going to be a little yeah, bit more exactly, sought after exactly for sure so what specifically what companies and what technologies are you focused on right now yeah you know i think i kind of started I still kind of want to break it down into I was trying to come up with some catchy thing, the seven pillars of, or summits of turf technology, something. Because, you know, there's even within this technology sector, there's there's these different breakdowns of, you know, we have we have imaging from the air, but then there's some fixed imaging kind of thing. And we have in-ground sensors, but then there's the portable soil sensor. Yep. So like kind of trying to identify the ones, A, I really thought values aligned and like obviously i believe in their tech kind of thing too Mm -hmm. um so yeah i mean the first one really that i talked to was matt with playbooks for golf and you know he has his coverage and kind of more just digital management software programs i'm kind of saying or agronomic management programs so kind of the online dashboard so that sector and you know i've talked with dr magro with pogo turf because i mean i think that's just incredible and i thought many more courses around us would be using it i'm sure they are but i went to the peaks and prairies gcsa and dr rossi's over there talking about pogo and he's like who's got a pogo and nobody in the audience yeah that 
that surprised me. And then he was like, who's got a GPS spray? And nobody raised their hand. So that kind of reinforced my thought of, okay, maybe these Mountain West courses aren't getting that kind of visibility on some of this newer stuff, you know? You, they can see it on the internet, but until it's in front of you, yeah. I feel like that's a little more powerful. Um, so yeah, I talked with Pogo, um, and then Groundworks is the in-ground sensor. I don't know if you've mm -hmm. heard from them. They're kind of yep. a smaller one. Um, let's see. And then, you know, the, the biggest one, I, I really want to get into the robotic mowers. It's been a little bit of a hurdle. I was originally going to do this national licensee program, but I didn't really like it or the vibe kind of thing. They were kind of more homeowners centered and then was going to work with Dr. McElroy being, he started his own little turf robotics uh, company down in Auburn and be kind of a Western arm, but then Echo only wanted to ship to him and then ship to me kind of thing. So now I'm trying to figure that out and get connected with into the a dealer for Echo or some of those brands. But I think that's where I might have to start finding some funds for those demo units and stuff. Cause I have a little bit of a savings, but you know, luckily a lot of the partnerships I've made and, kind of focusing more on maybe more consulting. I haven't had to do a bunch of up, upfront expenses, you know, kind of right, thing. Right. It's more getting that word out or they'll send me send me one of their demo units on on front net for me kind of thing. But yeah, the robotic mower is one I, I really believe in because I think it's such a big game changer for especially mountain courses where the labor is just so hard. I mean, labor is hard everywhere, but yeah. Jackson, living in Jackson Hole and, you know, you can offer... 25 26 27 dollars an hour to a pretty much a brand new laborer but it's still hard to get applications which just blows your mind you know yeah but well in seasonality paid 25 dollars at target yeah right seasonality and, is another challenge in, in this part of the world that and there's just and yeah exactly and housing so many other <clears throat> yeah housing and exactly we could have 30 applicants but we still wouldn't be able to find housing for them sometimes kind yeah. of thing like i think yeah. one time while well, i was at shooting star we weren't able to find housing for our GM and his family. And it's like, oh, this, no kidding. <laughs> this ain't good kind of thing. So, <laughs> oh, uh, so yeah, um, kind of just identifying the different parts of it, um, of technology and how I can kind of cover all those bases or at least just be informed, you know, even if some companies I've talked to and we haven't even really set up an official thing, but just like, yeah, if somebody says they heard us from you, then we'll, we'll work it out kind of thing. So I think, Kind of ironing out the details is where I'm kind of at right now and seeing what the structures are going to be, how I'm going to do it kind of thing is, is where I'm at now. Because I've, I've had on my website, I have most of the partners that I've talked to listed and it's all, it almost got to a point where I was like, all right, I got to stop now. I'm, I have too many, right. <laughs> too many people. Right. I need to like be able to know the ones well enough kind of thing. So I think I'm at a point now where, yeah, I got to start kind of figuring out how to, how to turn this to money and just more structured and actually talking to the supers you know for the past few months it's really been talking with the companies a lot um so so, so outside of the raw technologies i mean you said you're familiar with websites and things like that do you do that kind of service for for clubs or i can you know i've thought <laughs> about it you know i think i think even matt with playbooks does some of that and you yeah. know, i've seen a few others and i i used to do web design in middle school and high school and people always told me i, I should get into that because I, I have a knack for it but it just doesn't make me my wheels turn as much okay so kind of that marriage of the turf and the tech is where i think yeah. i can yeah for and sure you know i i and i think i would be interested in that as somebody if it's somebody i'm looking to build a relationship i don't want to maybe just build a website for you but if we're working together otherwise and i can help you with that part of it then i i think it'd be something i'd be interested in you know my other tagline is the technology driven solutions and like people first mindset so like i'm looking to build relationships because like again yeah. we're looking we're looking to 2050 so we're not going to do it you know i i could tell you all my partners and you could be stacked on them all and have the money to incorporate them all but that would just be crazy to try yeah. and do it all at once you know so like yep. yeah trying to build that relationship of hey let's do the mowers this year next year we'll start the drone program for you kind of gradually build yourself and yeah with that that future focused mindset kind of thing so uh, <laughs> i mean there's just so many so many directions i, I, could, I could see you <laughs> going right? in a hundred different directions exactly <laughs> so yeah so where do you so somebody somebody picks up the phone and calls you yeah. and says hey i need i need help identifying yeah the, you know your focus I obviously think I would, for sure i think i think how i really want to start is like where did they think they could mm -hmm use the help not even if they even know if there's tech or that could help them or anything just like 
where where's your problems is it is it hiring is it you know even you know i think you can get creative with that you know adam adam gar is doing some cool like video recruitment stuff and i think there i think there's tech solutions beyond just like the tools and stuff so yeah yeah, i think if they call me and said hey i i I want to start incorporating tech and it's like all right tell me tell me your most frustrating part about a day in the summer or something you know and who knows? It could be like, I hate writing emails to the membership. And that's when I'd be like, get on chat GPT. <laughs> we're, we're, getting, we're getting that. There. We're getting exactly. there. Hold, hold on. Uh, hold on. <laughs> but, you know, yeah. If they're, if it's, if it's truly just man hour labor, that's when it's like the robotic mowers can be a yeah. big change or yeah. we're in California and it's water usage or we have to, you know, we have a big water build and that's when we're switching towards that moisture management and ground sensors, maybe even drone imaging kind of thing. So I think, yeah, I think it's really because I don't want to come in and be like, I'm here to save your golf course by technology. I, that's not the attitude I want to bring. I, I think there's so much available tech and I think it could help so many managers and golf courses, but I don't want to be the brash young kid who's like, yeah. oh, do this, do this, do that. Right. So I kind of meet, meeting them where they're at, you know, because I think a lot of it is, again, their supers and assistants are just so busy and they see something that's cool, but they don't have time to, to dive deep. So. If I've already dove deep on it, then I can kind of give them a, a quick overview if that interests them. Let's talk about that. If not, let's move on to the next one kind of thing. For sure. Um, for sure. I've all, and I've only really met with one course so far, and it was my former GM at Shooting Star, so it was nice on a nice home turf. But, yeah, I kind of just even sat at him with his computer next to him on my website and scrolled through the partners, and I was like, here's what this does, here's what this does kind of thing. And he's like, oh, that sounds cool. We'd click on it and kind of look at it. and stuff so yeah i kind of think just having that really diverse offerings or just knowledge and then kind of working backwards and reverse engineering how we can help those biggest problems of theirs kind of thing yeah i'm writing notes as we're talking because i have a couple couple ideas for later (laughs) (laughs) um okay so let's talk i i want to i want to get into uh, ai in a little bit but, but let's talk about um gps and yeah and you know it's it's funny i i travel the western us for for my position and and see a lot of different um operations you know from low budget mm-hmm. to high budget to you totally. name it and obviously adoption of of that kind of tech seems to be at the higher budget golf courses but i can make an argument mm-hmm. that some of the mid and lower budget ones would benefit more from that that type of yep. tech so and, and i was I am not a techie, but I recognized yep. really quickly, gosh, probably been 12 or 12 or 15 years ago that the mm-hmm. GPS was going to be a, a staple For in sure. this industry. And so we were, totally. I was one of the first golf courses in the Northwest that, that adopted that we did a retrofit mm-hmm. kit. And, you know, there were some bugs, but, but talk about that for the, for the folks that haven't, you know, like you said, you were at the peaks of the yeah. meeting. Nobody has yeah, it in, in, I mean, in place. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up GPS, Frank, because that was that's what we used at my course as far as tech goes. You know, yeah. Uh, both my bosses were pretty self admittedly old school, so we were still doing the whiteboard and all that. App, but you know, one of them is kind of like you was like, I see the benefits in the GPS spring. You know, we're trying to spray these irregular shapes with a, a rectangular implement, right, so like, right. it makes sense, kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was the that was the one real tech that we implemented, and and for me, I've been saying like that made my life easier as both a manager, a direct manager of the spray program, but also the operator, mm-hmm. you know, because like just the 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 hours on a sprayer didn't get to me, but that tediousness of just having to be on it every time, you know, right. so and just that little bit of a breathing room, I feel like made my life as an operator so much easier, and I mean, I feel like the benefits of of the GPS spray beyond that as a manager was so apparent and not even just saving budget money, you know, cause, and that's important at some courses, maybe not as much at shooting star, but that visual difference when you could spray your greens and it was just a circle, you know, the, I the feel level like of accuracy is astounding. Isn't the it? first time we, you know, the first time we put tracker dye in there and, and we sprayed a, a test on the, uh, the nursery game. I, I remember Bill Shrum being like, you sprayed that that's it that he was he was yeah. impressed you know yeah. and he he had a keen eye yeah and so that's 
Yeah, the GPS spray technology, I kind of am liking in that. Like like you said, 12 to 15 years ago, that's when you first started hearing about it. That's kind of how it feels with the robotic mowers now. We're like, right. it's pretty viable and you're going to have some hiccups, but in five to 10 years, it's going to be here. And if you've already had one for five to 10 years and you know those those hiccups pretty easy, then you're going to have a, a much smoother time and and just be able to evolve with the, with the tech. Uh, Dr. Oh, Macro actually had... I like that. Really I like cool. that observation. That's a that's a great way to put it. Where you, I think Dr. McElroy put it in a really good way on one of his. He has a contrarian guide to robotic mowing, which I think is pretty good. He kind of calls out the skeptics on their like most bullet point talks and kind of walks them through. It. And he he talks about an iPhone. He goes, you know, how how good is an iPhone one compared to an iPhone fifteen now? Mm -hmm. You wouldn't touch it. Mm -hmm. How how many people when they first got that first iPhone were like, oh, this technology sucks. Like, why, like this isn't worth right. it. Right. It was know, the most amazing thing ever. Exactly. Yeah. And like they got yeah. plenty of use out of it. So like, yeah, I think realizing that it's all, you know, an evolution and spectrum and it's not going to be perfect, you know, but regular equipment isn't perfect either, you know? Right. So right. I think, I think trying not to get frustrated by technology is a big one, you know, realizing that there are hiccups and even robotic autonomous mowers aren't just a set it and forget it kind of thing, you know, it's still takes checking in on stuff and yeah. maintenance and making sure the plugs are good and all that. But, you know, no, not so different than a normal gas mower or something that you got to check when it comes in and check when it goes out. So I think realizing that you got to keep those same procedures in place for this stuff. You can't, it's going to help you a lot and make it more efficient, but there's, you know, there's still the human element. Thankfully, you know, we're right. not fully autonomous yet. <laughs> so are you, are you yeah, surprised think, that the scale hasn't caught up with the industry faster than it has? I, I mean, maybe I need to frame I that a little bit I think differently. So. so, I mean, I, like, I, I see a lot of golf courses that have, you know, the Husqvarna or, or the echo yeah. working around the clubhouse yeah. and doing that, that type of stuff. But mm -hmm. you know how that tech hasn't jumped more quickly from that. I think, I think it's scale. this year. I think that's this year. So you, honestly. you, you had some mentions on that fire, firefly automatics. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know yeah, if you're associated really with cool. them, but but I didn't see that. Not at the really. Show. I, I can kind of give you my background. So they were at the show. They were kind of over in the corner near the big stage. But honestly, again, I was focusing on these small companies and stuff. So I, yeah. I walked by that big, big behemoth looking thing. And I'm like, why are they going to want to talk to this solo kid from Jackson kind of thing? So I looked at it and it was cool at the show. But then I kind of kept walking because, again, like I didn't picture myself as this guy hooking up a trailer and hauling fairway mowers around. So that was kind of. Sure. Not in my wheelhouse, but you know, it was funny as I, right after the first, like the two or three weeks after the show, um, I was reaching out to everybody. And then there was a week where it was like, you called me, Firefly reached out to me, uh, Karechi, the robotic picker reached out to me. And suddenly mm -hmm. people started reaching out to me. I'm like, okay, okay. I'm making a little noise. <laughs> but Firefly, Firefly is actually based down in Salt Lake. Um, so their well, whole kidding. factory is based in Salt Lake. All uh, pretty much, you know, I, I don't know the percentage or don't know their fact sheet as well, but. Not over ninety percent of those parts are made in that in that warehouse. You know wow. their factory. They have a CNC metal cutting machine, a whole welding shop, powder coating and sandblasting. Like it was really impressive. So he, you know, he, David Collier, the national sales director, hits me up. And he's like, "Hey, I see you're close. Like, let me know if you're ever in Salt Lake, kind of thing." And I was like, "Well, I don't have much going on now, so <laughs> let's do this. I'll come hours, down. Right? <laughs> yeah, I'll come down next week. That this seems awesome. So yeah, I went down and saw their factory and." Huh. You know, they started as sod harvesters and their sod harvesters are very impressive. But, you know, I think they originally were trying to get into the fairway mowing and they they built a really nice cutting unit and stuff. But I think it was still man driven. I think it was all electric, but it was still operated by a human. And so that price point just couldn't compete with Toro and, and Breakthrough or, or sure. John Deere and break through those big companies. But then they switched it to autonomous and suddenly people started being a little more willing and a little more excited about a new thing out there. So I think huh. they're getting a lot, a lot of interest, um, but they seem really focused on making sure they don't roll out too early. You know, so, they want to be able to go to scale and hit it running. So I think they're, you know, drumming up interest this year. And I think 2025 is when they're trying to be at, at full scale and really going. And they're pretty impressive. You know, they're light they're They look so good. You know, are, that. So tell me, tell me specifically, and I don't want, I don't want to dwell on this yeah, a yeah. lot, but so they're no, no, still, no. still beta testing their product is that you know no i think it's they have the i think it's the amp 100 and i i think they're 
have installed on one golf course so far. Okay. And they might, and I think they have five to eight demo units. But as, as I was there, they had one assembly line going for the mowers, and they were looking to then, because they, I think they had originally built a bigger autonomous mower for sod harvesting, and he basically somewhat admitted like this isn't, that one's not the answer. We needed to do it to figure out stuff, but he thought they were going to move away from this bigger giant contraption. And so they're actually going the opposite direction. To, they're scaling down rather exactly. than scaling so, up. Interesting. And so, and exactly because they started figuring out like even the sod farms, we could just sell two or three of these smaller ones to yeah. them for the price of this giant one that was giving them trouble kind of thing that just yeah. didn't feel like it was it for him. And he even said like, maybe we pivot to use that chassis and frame for, for something else. But, yeah, they're trying to push that assembly line out and then get a second one going. And I think he was hoping to be up to, you know, eight to 10 a month or something by next year kind of thing to to meet what they think might be demand. And is this a um, rotary or, or a real driven unit? It's a real. It but is. Okay. as I was there, they, they were testing uh, some rotaries, literally like switch. It, it was kind of funny because, you know. You picture what a factory like that looks in your head. Yeah. And sure enough, we walk up to the mower and there's this computer with all these wires coming out. This engineer pops up out from a, oh yeah, we're just getting the decks on, about to do the first mow. And I'm like, wow, this is like really it. This is where they're doing yeah. the cutting edge of technology kind of thing. It's it's kind of cool to see. And yeah, they they were interested to talk to me since I was, you know, on on golf courses and they're all very high level engineers who know it but don't quite get mm -hmm. the true applicability of it. So yeah, I got to talk to one of their head engineers and even start spitballing on future of are you eventually going to be able to geofence with a with the groundworks in ground sensor to to keep the mower out automatically kind of thing. You know, it's too yeah. wet over there. Just it won't, it'll just automatically do a stay out zone kind of thing. And they hit the engineer's wheel start turning. He's like, yeah, we can probably do that pretty easy. He's like, I'd never thought about that kind of thing. So Very cool. yeah, it's cool to kind of be able to spitball with them and give them some ideas and and feel like they wanted to talk to me kind of thing. So yeah, yeah, it, was, yeah. it was really cool to see their whole thing. And I honestly, even just, they got that blue color, that, that kind of, you know, red, green. Now there's a, now there's a blue. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That probably yeah. wasn't an accident, was it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's interesting. Yeah. I, I did not realize they were an American based company. That's, that's even, that yeah. makes it even and more have, attractive. Have you looked at it, at the uh, robotic picker at all? The Karechi? Did you see that at all? No. I think they're down there, but uh, it's uh, on a, obviously more golf shop side of things. But yeah, yeah, they again, he kind of found me on Instagram or uh, LinkedIn or Twitter or something and reached out. And they're based out of Canada, but they're funny because they're almost going backwards too, where they were a farming robotics company. Because I've always been saying that it's trickling down from ag. But yeah, more, when I talk to people lately, it seems like some ag companies are just bailing and coming to golf because he said, you know, he was this was the Karechi like engineer. He was, he was very smart and he was like, you know, robotic robots are good at doing one job really well. And they they can do maybe a second one pretty good. Uh -huh. And they're going to be, they're going to be as detailed as your best worker, but they're going to be as slow as your worst worker. So but really, steady. so really, yeah, exactly. So finding those daily repetitive mundane yeah. tasks is what robots are going to be really good for. So. They had farming robots that were going out and seeding and tilling, but like you do that once a year and then toss the robot in the shed kind of thing. And sure, you could have different attachments, but again, he was really focused on it does one thing well. So like, we don't want a, a robot that does a bunch of things okay. Like he wants it one really well. So his was a cool to talk to to just have that kind of higher level of robotics thinking and hear some of that. Um, but that one, the it's a Karechi. They have a. They have a, a unit that hooks onto current uh, baskets, and then they have their own self-contained unit. Um, and they look pretty impressive. You know, I think Echo has a, the range picker as well, but yeah, only holds 300 balls and has to have a ramp. The Karechi seems to me to be to be the one that's going to be poised to be the leader in the next few years, I think. Okay. okay. Um, Interesting. It, yeah. <laughs> oh. But, it, it, you know, that one kind of caught my eye, too, because then I could go talk to the golf shops too, instead of just the, yeah. the turf guys kind of thing and have, yeah, you, you can make a trip. You might as, well, well, so. might as well have it. Yeah. And, and that, exactly, so. I'll tell you working on both sides of the, uh, the business in, in my career, that's a job I would, I would gladly outsource to a robot because yeah, it just exactly. seems like that's something and that, that we don't even for need, sure. need to waste. And labor that one's on. really cool. Cause like they start, you know, you can start making different zones. So, 
if it, you know, the main spot, you can have it hit more and then do a, a large pick. And I'm positive it'll eventually get to the point where it's, it's learning where it's picking up more and it'll go start circling there more kind of thing. So interesting. again, interesting. yeah, the, what's the technology, I think a lot of, on a lot of this stuff is, especially the more robotic and autonomous stuff, it's finally getting viable. And so it's exciting. But then like, yeah, those next five, 10, 15 years is where I'm really thinking it's going to be, be cool to see. Well, the cool, the cool thing about a lot of this stuff, I mean, you, you, you take a, a, a vehicle like Tesla, right? I mean, most yep. of the upgrades that happen are software upgrades, right? So if they build That's the platform, exactly. like, it's, it's pretty yeah. amazing the changes that can be made. Yeah. You know, Task and Tracker, even, I'm, I'm good friends with Jerry and, and yep, Jamie yep, yep. at Task Tracker. I mean, those guys have been able to make changes on the fly when, you know, somebody, somebody gives so an input. Great. It's yeah, amazing. Exactly. I think that's really key. And yeah, it's cool once you really start, you know, because that's a software program. So that makes sense. But yeah, once you start getting to these bigger machines that are going to be able to be just upgraded that way or fix that glitch that's giving you a problem, that's yeah. a really cool part. And, you know, what, what, what aftermarket GPS company did you get or did you use? So it was, uh, it's so long ago, I can't remember. Yeah, it, was a, yeah. it, it was a spray company um, out of, kind of my area but they were representing gotcha. um the ag leader or a raven it, it it was there was a raven controller but it was i want to yeah. say it was sharpshooter maybe oh yeah i think so that based out of the midwest the, like, originally brand. yeah 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 but like i you know some of that like because you know toro and gps have their sprayers and stuff but they've made it their systems kind yeah. of thing so it's that's that's one technology that i didn't realize that there was other options kind of thing. You know, we got Toro sprayers, so that's just what I knew, but I start seeing these aftermarket and suddenly they have remote control cap capabilities and maybe Toro does right. now. We, we didn't at the time where they can get on my controller and figure out what, what the bug is instead of having to have me punch it in kind of yeah. thing. So yeah, I, I mean, I think just whenever I heard that you could remote in onto the controller that made it even like, oh, wow, you could train somebody from oh, a ways no, away kind of no thing. Doubt. And, yeah, I worked with with Ag Enterprises, which is just on the other side of Spokane for me. And yeah, um, you know they uh, they're building a lot of a lot of uh, sprayers of their own, but they'll also go in and retrofit some stuff. And and yeah. for, for and me at the time, so cool. yeah, for me at the time, the the, the big equipment uh, manufacturers weren't there yet, and so yeah. uh, I think the retrofit cost me under twenty grand. We don't, <laughs> yeah. as you know, we don't spray a lot of fungicides and chemist yeah. chemistries so for me yeah. the the roi was all on labor and time yep but it was yeah, astounding just, how quickly the payback happened yeah. for us so and you know we're us superintendents and turf managers so ocd that again that pure of just not seeing the the squared triangles around right. the green when i sprayed them which is so satisfying to me yeah. man yeah that's one of the technology the aftermarket I, I didn't realize it was such a big market and i that's one that I really want to to champion to to courses. Like you like you like your sprayer, whichever color it is, because they they do sprayers well. Now right. let's let's part now let's partner with the GPS people that do GPS really well. Yeah, you know, no no shade to the Toro Topcon or JD Link or whatever it's called, but I think I think you you know they're still going to be happy that you're buying the sprayer from them. But you know, I think there's some really cool, a little more bomb proof and tested gps after fit aftermarket kits that i think could be a lot more accessible and and you can get faster you know yeah, when yeah i've been what my, my partner on that end is is turf flux they're based out of philly but they they really focus on aftermarket kits and that's kind of what caught my eye and you know and they they were happy to to expand their market if i find somebody and sure. kind of train me up on the flying kind of thing and so that's what i focus on and when they told me that you know you can go to a superintendent and say they their sprayers up in two years, slap that aftermarket kit on that one, and when they buy yep. the new sprayer, take that one off and put it on the new one, and you already know all the bells and whistles of the GPS, and right. can get the sprayer you want. And I I think that's really powerful, and I think again I I didn't know those options were exist, so I think being able to to lay those options out to the the supers could help and kind of turn the wheels a little more than just thinking it's only Toro or JD doing it. Well, I think it's a lot easier too to have a conversation if the price point, you know, isn't a six figure, <laughs> a six figure number, totally. you know, exactly. when you can get there. Yeah, for sure. Exactly, um, for sure. 
Okay, so uh, I am a dinosaur, and uh, yep, <laughs> I, I I I want you to I want you to walk me through because you you do some work with AI, and I I have I have no idea where where this leads for sure or or any of that stuff. Yeah, and I, know, I know you dabble a little bit for but, sure, but specifically, what I wanted to get from you is how how will it help turf managers? Cool. Give me a couple of bullet yeah. points as to as to you know. A, how, how, you know, how do you get into it? How, you know, you, you mentioned yeah. early on chat GPT. So how do you get yeah. started in that? And then what would be the, the basic yeah. applications? For sure. Yeah. I mean, the simple caveat of, man, I, I've dove a little bit into AI and it seems like every day there's something new kind of thing. Yeah. Honestly. So I, for sure. And so chat GPT is definitely the one everybody thinks of, and that's, I, that's the one I started messing around with and the, their free version only has their, their text one basically. Okay. But then they had $20 a month and that's when I was like, let's see what this does. And that's when they, you know, they have more basically what they call specialized GPTs kind of thing. And so basically I could create one myself for, for how, for a greens nutrient program. And it's basically just, it's memorizing that conversation you start and it becomes more specialized. But what I, at first I was just messing around in the text of chat DPT. I was like, oh, this is cool. Write me a joke about this or something or do this kind of thing. But I think where it really becomes powerful is when you really start thinking about these just different workflows and how can I, how can I use it? Not even necessarily to create a, a backend or a, a finished product that I'm going to post somewhere or use something, but just to like help you think. And, you know, there's a one really cool one that I've been using. It's like a PDF summarizer, you know, I've been getting some giant long contract from Karecki that they want me to look over and I'll read it, but then I'll pop it in that thing and say, give me the main bullet points or pull out the financial information out of that kind of thing. And it will give you these bullet points. And I, you know, so, I think that's really powerful. Okay. So, so, so stop on that for a minute. So yeah, yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> I, I, again, dinosaur, right? Yeah. So, for sure. so there are, are these like within chat GPT or these drop downs? That, Basically. That... Yeah. It's like, you kind of, Click on it and the left sidebar has, or the home landing page has different ones. And again, again I'm pretty much, so there's chat GPD, which is kind of the text. I think they call it LLMs, large language models, I yep. believe. Yep. And I think it's measured by how many total parameters or something. Again, I haven't dove too deep in all that jargon, but then they have Dolly, which is their art generator. And so that, that okay. was definitely the one that created the most stir on Twitter. And I, yeah. that's half the reason I think Firefly and Karechi reached out to me just because I was posting interesting AI art. And so that was when I, I kind of started realizing you could combine these different little GPTs together. So at first, you know, I'd type in, make me a, a moose on my golf course in front of the Tetons and it would do all right. But then if I went into chat GPT and said, give me an image description, to take the dolly of a moose playing golf in front of the Tetons, then it'd give you this really wordy mm. description itself. And then I'd take that description to dolly and then plug that in and then it'd give me a, a more descriptive. And even then, sometimes I realized that more descriptive didn't be, mean better. It could, it could make it too confused. So I kind of realized it's almost, it's almost just like your logical mind working with the AI and interacting with chat GPT or whatever one you're using. You kind of, it responds better when you walk it you know, prompt okay. engineering is what they're calling it. All so right. being good at asking it the questions. And again, I've, do I've had, I've followed a few on Twitter and, you know, I get the, here's what's new in AI every day. And they have all these different classifications of methods. Now there's one that was like the reactive method versus the chain of thought method kind of thing of, and then if you combine the two, it's even more accurate because there's problems that they're having with chat GPT basically if you don't ask it to prove it it'll just make up stuff um <laughs> right <laughs> and so that's so that's why I really think you have to be a transparent and b really read over what what it produces if it's something you're going to post as a finished product somewhere you know okay and if, especially if you're trying to post it as I wrote this blog you know on my website I have a blog but I just called it the AIT blog the assistant and turf blog basically and it's my AI blog and so I just did it honestly for search engine optimization kind of thing and just churning out blogs to fill out the website. But I wanted to be like, this isn't me thinking, this isn't me trying to portray myself as the own blogger. This is, I'm saying this is an AI blog, you know? And okay. I think that's really where a lot of it's going to come down to is 
transparency and stuff. But I, you know, especially with turf, we don't do, we just, there's not a lot of finished product that we need to post kind of thing. But one of the ones I really think chat GPD in the most simplest form could help is those daily update emails for superintendents. How many times have you sat down yeah. the day after Tuesday and been like, how am I going to write the same thing without sa saying the same words, saying the same thing, you know? And so you could even just take Tuesday's email and say, regenerate this in a different form for me. Hmm. Or if you want to get fun, they'd be like, rewrite this in a Dr. Seuss tone, rewrite this in a Stephen King tone. You know, you can really play with it. And, really? And may maybe then you get three paragraphs and you're like, well, I don't, my members aren't going to read three paragraphs. It's so like condense it to a paragraph. And then boom, it's down to that. So I think, I think those stuff that maybe makes superintendents a little more uncomfortable, the communications, that kind of stuff, the creative side, I think that's where it could help them and just take that stress kind of off it of, shoot, I have to go back to the office and write the daily email kind of thing. Like now it's just, oh, I'll go back, do it real quick and then get back out in the field kind of thing. And I mean, even, even the AI art, it's just so fast. And if you don't need it perfect, you can create a pretty catchy image right away to go with that email if you want, you know? So I think simple ones like that are, are where superintendents are going to find it. But I mean, AI, AI can be anything. It's machine learning. So all this technology that we're using is going to be using AI too. But as far as chat GPT and what we think of as AI, I think that's the most simple use for superintendents. It almost seems, communication tools. It almost seems like with the, with the, the, the pace of change in that technology it almost seems like you know you listen to content creators and they're always trying to beat the algorithm every day you know the yeah the algorithm exactly yeah for sure it's is very changing similar. all the time so you know like i said i followed a few of the ai people on twitter and suddenly they're you know i guess there's some ranking of the best ai and i guess this new one claude is now technically better than chat gpt but then this guy says it's going to come back later in the week and it's just it's just too much for me i'm like hi in the week, I, I get right? it. Like that's yeah, it's happening yeah. that it's quickly. Like, for sure. Like, and just new announcements every day. Cause it's one of those things, it's like a snowball. The AI gets smarter and yeah. then it just makes itself smarter. And just, yeah, it's kind of hard to wrap my brain around, but it's been fun to kind of play around. And I even had a meeting with Groundworks cause they were like, maybe we can use this. We should talk to this, you know, guy yeah. we already have a relationship going with. And so I talked with Tim and their CEO. And I think we're going to meet again this week to try and do some AI video or something for one of their promotions kind of thing so so if yeah a, it's got, i think and i think industry partners honestly could probably use it more than superintendents themselves yeah. um yeah. and I've, I've i've i'm pitching to turfnet to try and host a webinar for ai leverage for superintendents and industry partners sometime that i think could be a very interesting easy intro kind of thing of basically intro to prompt engineering and then i think even just saying prompt engineering makes it you know you start to get it you're like okay you don't just have to you can't just type something and you, if you really want to use it to its power, you got to think about it. And then also just really identifying use cases kind of thing and yeah. where you can use it kind of thing instead of just knowing it exists in the back of your head. But if you, if you have a dedicated, oh, I'm going to use it for my morning email, then you start seeing the power of it and then maybe you can use it for something else kind of thing. So, <laughs> so again, that I think a, that gradual. You think that's a starting point for, um, for, for, a, for a 50 something I think so. I think so. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, you know, I sent out a email sur or a, a technology survey, which anybody listening should definitely go fill that out. I'm trying to just kind of get the numbers on what, what this adaption is or who's interested in what and from all over the country kind of thing. But yeah, one, you know, I have an option. Do you want me to email you some more info? And so this one guy was interested in, in AI. And so I, I typed up an email myself and I sent it to him. And then I was like, at the end, I was like, I'm going to take this email, I'll put it in chat GPT, and then I'm going to tell it to rewrite it in a more friendly genuine tone or something or a professional tone and then i just sent them that email after it so i think even just like taking your own emails and rewriting them even if you don't see it send them just to see the capabilities and stuff because i feel like when you just get on there and mess around for fun you you can see the power but it doesn't really become obvious how to use it you're just like oh this is cool i'm probably not going to play with it or use it but like i think if you if it's something you're already doing, like an email or something, yeah, you can see how it rewrites it. I think that is like powerful and shows you like think gives of a you the task. Gives you Yeah, it gives you like your example and then it shows you what it what it might could be kind of thing. Right. Think of a you task know, they, that you don't like and, and assign it yeah, to Yeah, exactly. Right? 
Interesting. What? All right. So without getting political or anything yeah, like yeah. that, what, what are the societal dangers of this? What do you, I mean, I, I know, hear a lot of the, a lot of the negatives sure. too, like it's going to take over the totally. world and not going to need you know, us anymore. So it, and it's pretty funny. I, when I was working on, I, uh, Turfman, uh, uh, Jeff, I helped him with his pro- polar bear thing that he's been posting a bunch and yeah. there we go. It gave me a square image and they're like, I'm going to use it on a blog for Turfnet. And he's like, can you expand it out? And I was like, I don't know. We might have reached the the end of at least my capabilities kind of thing as a graphic artist and AI guy. But then I got him Photoshop and then I have this brush that you just basically brush the background and then click fill. And sure enough, it filled it pretty much in the same style and seamlessly. And so two minutes later, I emailed Peter at Turfnet back and I was like, good news. I did it. Bad news. That was like way too easy. <laughs> like maybe we are going to get taken <laughs> right. over. So, you know, after that was, even when I was talking with Tim from Groundworks, he's like, you know, are, are people going to lose jobs over this? And I'm like, they're going to have to. Like, yeah. I mean, yeah. but that's just with anything. And I think the people that realize that it's not a perfect solution in any ways, and they're still going to be need to be human interacting when using it, I think is basically it's like you know these companies that the early adopters and people willing to change i think are going to thrive you know and luckily our industry is a lot more human proof i feel like than some kind of thing like where mm-hmm. there's in no scenario in my mind by 2050 are we fully away from a golf course being managed by humans in my opinion i mean I maybe agree. i'm completely wrong but other industries yeah they, they might be fully away from humans for the most part you know how many staff writers on a newspaper are going to exist anymore in yeah. 2050 if you could have three that really do the main articles and two other guys who basically run the ai section you know um, well, it's, it's kind of the cycle that 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 history has shown in other i think so i mean it's and just I think another cycle for sure and you're not gonna it's not gonna stop you know and there's gonna be regulations and and ways to figure it out. And again, I think that transparency on what's AI and what's not, what's been helped with AI, especially I feel for the the creatives and the artists the most. Mm-hmm. But again, you know, the artists that used to paint on canvas had to eventually get used to the new digital art that yeah. people wanted for their websites. And like, so it's just an evolution and, you know, there will always be the need for human touch. Um, Lee Strutt was on with Pat Jones. I think I re- we posted it and he said something basically where it came down to golf is about the people. Golf needs people. Like the robots are going to help us, but like in the end, it's a, it's a people person game industry. Yeah. So like he, again, like he doesn't, neither do i we don't want the robots taking over but if we can make our lives and better as turf managers through this technology and stuff then i think that's the key and not not being afraid and luckily it's a it's a pretty easy sell even with autonomous mowers you know maybe the uninformed non-supers are like oh they're taking jobs from golf course workers but we all know that it's not an endless amount of jobs on a golf course that's right if we if we can get you know team member a off a rough mower for eight hours a day for two or three days a week, then he can probably do something that improves the golfer experience a lot more. Yeah. Or let's do that project we haven't been able to do because we just may comes in the growing season and then suddenly it's October. You know, yeah. we yeah. we all know that. So I think I think that's the super exciting part of of how it can help all the courses. I think circling back where you're saying that, you know, GPS seems to be attracted to the high end, but I think with a little education and a little foresight foresight on an upfront investment i think those like lower end and middle budget courses are where they can start making up some real cool ground especially when you're yeah. a five-man crew kind of thing if you can free up that so much mowing <laughs> then wow you're gonna be able to level those heads or fix that irrigation that's been leaking for years kind of thing so i i think that's where it's exciting and and hopefully where a lot of the maybe grumpier supers and turf managers might finally come around to like this is going to help me not take over my job and i don't think too many think that but you know there's still just that old school mentality in here and and just slow to adapt and but actually talking with the tech companies golf courses are a lot quicker to adapt than ag you know they they i believe that guy made he made a really good point of if you go to a farmer you better 
be able to prove that it is going to increase his yield because that's all that matters, you know? Right, right. Whereas a golf course, we might be like, yeah, let's try that out. That might be easier or give us better playing conditions kind of thing. You you have a little more, the goal is a little more nebulous compared to just we want more yield or we want higher profits kind of yeah. thing. It's playable playable conditions is a little more abstract kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and I think it, I think it all folds into the, the revolution of the you know mlsn and just doing less to get the same conditions you know i i think sometimes supers get a little bit like we have to do something or else we're lazy yeah, yeah. but why do it if we're gonna get the same conditions you know i'm i'm definitely not trying to say we should never air fire anything but have superintendents become too reliant on air fine? maybe you know and it's really exciting to see that now we're going to manage it or measure organic matter and right are we doing it just because we like, yeah because we've always done it that bingo. way right and, <laughs> and so yeah i think that kind of rolls yeah. in with with that thing and being able you know the technology is what's going to be able to measure and once we measure it then we can manage it kind of thing so yeah i think it's kind of cool to see how it all builds on itself and cool yeah so uh <laughs> I, i'm looking at the clock and <laughs> <laughs> I like, yeah, we no can way. do this for I'm hours. I'm happy to come back. We're, we're going to, yeah, I'm exactly. definitely going to have you back. I've got a hundred thousand cool. more questions. So, yeah, totally. so you, you kind of, uh, you kind of mentioned this earlier. So give me your 25 year outlook. What's gotcha. two, two questions. What's, yeah. what are the biggest changes that you think we'll see? And number two, what okay. things won't change? It's hmm. a good question. I think. I think the biggest thing we'll see change is, I mean, if I really want to get specific, I think by then we'll, we'll be dialed on variable rate spraying and, mm -hmm. and probably creating those prescription <laughs> maps off of a few different things, maybe drone imaging with in-ground sensing or, you know, some fixed imaging yeah. cameras in certain spots kind of thing. So I think that's one that, you know, you talk to, to the, you know, I talked to Sam Smith at Above Par Tech, who's a super smart guy. He had a recent maybe Talking Greenkeeper podcast that um, did a, a lot of good talking. And, you know, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. Um, Prescription. He was, yeah, okay. Yep. Variable rate spray. And then he was, you know, they have that capability in, in ag now, you know, but it's still, right. it's it's figuring out how to get the prescription map easily to then go straight to the sprayer. Cause like right now we could probably do variable rate spraying on a golf course, but you'd probably have to go out there and map out that circle certain spot and be like, this is where I want this. But yeah, in 2050, I think this whole ecosystem is just going to come a lot more seamless. You yeah. know, your, your end ground water sensor is going to turn on and off your sprinkler, you know, yeah. Yeah. or, or tell you how much it's going to water your, your drone's going to give you the, that variable rate nitrogen application you know this is gonna it's just all gonna be a lot more integrated i think i i i don't know what you know what technology i mean i i guess i wouldn't be surprised if we were fully autonomous mowers by then even down to the the greens you know mm -hmm. that's one that i think is a good example of almost being correct but not quite the cub cadet rg3 you know, we look back and it's like, why were we mowing the lowest amount of acreage and the thing that totally. gets scrutinized the most? Totally. But at the time, you're like, oh, yeah, that looks cool. Look at it mowing yeah, straight I, lines. Like it. But then you just think about it you and that. you're like, why were we not mowing rough this whole time? Yeah. Like, well, same on the fertility so, side for me. I mean, I, you know, yeah. I could, I could sell a, a, a program for somebody for three acres or we could look at the other 90. You know, and yeah, it, yeah, yeah I, that's, I, that's always baffled me why the scale didn't mm -hmm. start at the other end and work its way back. For sure. Totally. And so, yeah, I think, you know, I don't think it's out of the question that we have probably fully autonomous mowers by then. Yeah, I think the things that aren't going to change, you know, I think I think we'll still be doing course setup. You know, that's one mm -hmm. that jumps out to me. I think you'll mm -hmm. still be out there cutting holes and probably moving T markers yourself kind of thing. And probably doing some data know? entry at the same time to, to, yeah, exactly. to make the tech work. For sure. Them. Cause you know, as good as stuff is, you know, an in-ground sensor can only be at that spot. So yeah. in-ground yeah. sensors are great, but if I'm telling somebody to get an in-ground sensor, I'm probably going to tell them to do some other monitoring other ways, you know, yeah. get a portable pogo or do that drone imaging that covers the whole property kind of thing. But yeah, you know, the things that are still going to be the same, 
that's that's tough you know i think i think we're still just going to be dealing with golfers you know that's yeah never going to change hope if, so as long as golf courses are around yeah exactly or, or else <laughs> it's just not, no maybe the maybe the robots are going to want to play golf who knows <laughs> yeah yeah um interesting and i think beyond just beyond just pure technology i think grass selection and just all that's just going to get so much better you know no and just the new courses i think that the new courses being built right now are the ones that i think can take advantage of the technology the most you know yeah. you really have that foresight of hey we need this much power to to Set charge the our infrastructure autonomous mowers out on yeah yeah and, yeah and honestly even just on a practical level i've gotten excited on robotic mowers because man how fast could you put a 35 pound autonomous mower on sod once you put sod down mm -hmm. pretty quick you know compared mm -hmm. to your normal rough mode, you know, I built the course, I helped build the course in Steamboat. We basically took over once they laid the sod down and we did, we'd set <laughs> these high school kids out free, just walk mowing fairways. Right. <laughs> be like, don't worry about the pattern. Just make sure everybody to grass is mowed. And <laughs> just, they just cut it all. Doing the craziest thing. So like, yeah, if you could just have one out there doing it itself kind of thing yeah, and that's not causing ruts and stuff. I think the, the new, the new courses are where it's a really exciting thing. And, where I think currently you can get the most out of technology. Um, but yeah, the stuff that's going to stay the same again, I think golfers cutting yeah. holes in the greens, just that stuff that's, you know, and I think it's going to be, again, be, you're just going to be able to be so much more project management oriented instead of that, those daily tasks that bog us down. And, yeah. you know, we've all had it, you know, we have these big grand grandiose plans for a summer and then, Again, May hits and June hits, and then it's October, you know? Yeah, yeah. And no so employees I, I, show I up think, and yeah, all that. Exactly. Stuff. And yeah. I think that's the exciting part of just, just kind of a, I don't think it's going to be unrecognizable, which I think is exciting, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, just adapt. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, exactly. All right. So, so uh, to kind of wrap up, I always do what I call a lightning round and it's just a little cool. bit more to get, get to know you. And, and yeah, yeah. The first thing that pops into your head is kind of what I'm looking for. So, uh, <laughs> Couple of boilerplate ones. Are you a beer or wine guy? Beer. Yeah, I like some especially, wine. My, my especially where you are, right? Wine person. Yeah, I went down to Argentina in de December, and there's some fun, good wine down there. So, oh, cool. It was yeah. fun to eat a nice Argentine steak and, and sip on some wine, but definitely more of a beer person. Nice. But honestly, I'm I'm more of a Lacroix seltzer water guy. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't count. Uh, college or pro, college or pro sports? College for sure. I, I grew up a huge alabama fan i'm from chattanooga tennessee which is right on georgia tennessee alabama border and so it was in the 90s when bama was not bama football okay. as as they are now kind of thing we had some success early in the 90s and then late in the 90s we got on probation and there's a time where tennessee beat us seven years in a row and i i can distinctly remember my like third or fourth grade year just crying to mom <laughs> Don't make me go to school on Monday. Like I can't. even the teachers, even the teachers are gonna give it to me. Like, just give me one day and they'll kind of blow over. But now nah, they made me go. And so sure enough, I went to I went to undergrad at Alabama and, and I got it back. I got I got three championships in my four and a half uh years at Alabama under Nick Staben. So since then it's been kinda been kind of gravy. You know, yeah. I, I we've had we've had more championships, but once you see three in college, I almost it almost felt like my sports fandom had been achieved. I remember thinking when I was in the Rose Bowl, the first championship we won, I was like, cool. I saw my one football championship. That's all you really get in college football. Awesome. And then, then Auburn won it the next year. And I was like, well, that sucked. But then we won it the next two. So yeah. it worked out. <laughs> cool. And now cool. we're going to our first Final Four. So I'm stoked on that. Yeah, that's that's a big deal. I, I, I yeah. actually I like the coach a lot. I think he's done a great yeah. job with that program. Very cool. Fun games to watch uh, for sure. Okay, so this is a little more personal, but I, I yeah, I've got a guess, but uh, PC or Mac? PC, actually. Really, I didn't. I yeah. wouldn't guess that. Okay. And I mean, I have iPhone and the iWatch and stuff, but yeah. I just I grew up on the PC and just okay. I don't know the the weirdness of the Mac keyboard and the Windows flying all around. I just yeah, I yeah. never get on it. But I, I have fun. thought about it since I've gotten back in the tech game because for when I was assistant, I feel like I didn't touch a laptop. So. Yeah. Yeah. For years kind of thing. I just would do my yeah. random two that, emails a week on, on the computer. That may office. change a year from now, right? Exactly, for sure. Uh, uh, okay, so last two are, are both bucket list things. Bucket list golf course. Ooh, ooh, bucket list golf course. You know, it's funny. I, I've really fallen in love with nine-hole golf courses and little quirky mm -hmm. golf courses. Mm -hmm. um, so honestly, mm -hmm. 
one of them is one I've played so many times that I would play all the time. Sweeten's Cove. I don't know if you've ever heard of oh, that. Oh, I've heard Little a lot Nine about hole. it. I haven't, I haven't played it, though. That one's cool because it has this cult following. And I was in, I was in turf grad school playing as much golf as I could when I was at Mississippi State. My dad called me and said, there's a new golf course being built in South Pittsburgh. South Pittsburgh this little bumble redneck town outside Chattanooga. And I was like, why are they building a golf course in South Pittsburgh? So they're having a soft opening when I came home. And I went out there and I was just like blown away. I played wow. it four times around and I met the architect. He figured out I was in turf and we've become really good friends. And now he's some big shot architect kind of thing. So that one just like, oh man, it just gives me so much happiness when I'm out there. But the honors course, I haven't been on here and that's in Chattanooga mm -hmm. here. It's perennial top 50. So that's yeah. definitely a bucket list one. I think if I go further out, Tara Eady. Um, okay. I just remember watching some no laying up blog with my, one of our uh, roommates that worked in the pro shop and we just were drooling. And I was like, wow, we need to get cool. out there. So I think somewhere like that, I think the, the setting is really, really big for me. Like, I think, I think golf's a cool reason to travel kind of thing and yeah. see other stuff, you know, yeah. golf or concerts. I'm a big climber and <laughs> skier. So that's what we base a lot of our travel around as well. So yeah. I okay. So being able to go somewhere beautiful. Yeah. So that's the other question. Uh, I know you have other interests like climbing and skiing and stuff. So what's your other, what's your bucket list trip that you haven't done yet? Oh, so oh, last when in December, we went down to Argentina. My, my fiance is a big climber as well. And she almost even has bigger eyes than me sometimes as far as goals and what she believes me and her are capable of. <laughs> sometimes I maybe am a little self-limiting on that. I'm like, yeah, that looks cool, but could we really do that kind of thing? So, <laughs> you know, the Patagonia logo has what's the Fitzroy Massif. And uh -huh. so that's way down in Southern Patagonia and beautiful, beautiful climbing, but like pretty serious, you know, like you kind of have to have all your ducks in a row. You got to be fit. You got to know how to rock climb you gotta know how to ice climb just kind of an all-around athlete and, and so i think we're just slowly building that that tool belt up to to head down there hopefully for our honeymoon so in december we went to kind of more of a friendlier intro spot in in more northern argentina and did some climbing in patagonia so that was definitely a bucket list that's now kind of up the next bucket list trip back down there to to go back there but then kind of go into some of the bigger mountains and and head up one of those so very cool and that one I think it'll be really cool because my my fiance Dave that was a a big goal when we first like met and she wanted to do it right after she graduated grad school but then she moved up and it's kind of got pushed away so yeah I think we'll we'll probably get married in September 2025 next year and then hopefully December January February time we'll head back down to Patagonia for a month or two and be able to bounce around and chase some weather windows and do some really cool stuff which I'm excited about I like it I like it that's that's pretty neat. Uh... Okay, Benton Hodges, thanks, uh, man. Yeah, I, thanks so much. We could we could talk a lot more, <laughs> sure. and, and we will. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to have you back. Yeah, but. I'm excited to do another one, and I'd love to, if we wanted to get, you know, some of these people I've talked to from different companies even, and, yeah. you know, how they vision their little sector of the I've, technology, I've a, maybe I've got a couple honing things. in a little more. Yeah, I've got a couple things offline for you, but um, how, how can we reach you if somebody wants to get a hold of you and kind of try to... Yeah, you know, you can always find me on Turf Twitter, uh, at BPH Turf um my website has all my other contact info it's very easy turf 2050.com okay um and yeah that's that's the easiest way that'll have my phone number and email feel free to reach out text call i'm i'm pretty connected and checking the phone frequently so yeah right. trying to trying to be responsive in my uh my business as well so feel free to reach out very cool ben thanks so much uh i think there's lots yeah. more to talk about with this it's sure. this whole part we, of the world. Well, we got 25 years ahead of it. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so exactly. we got time. <laughs> no, thanks. Thanks for sharing what you've learned so far and, and looking forward yeah, uh, to for some updates. You bet. Uh, everybody, yeah, thanks for thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, we just celebrated our 200th episode, and uh, this will be number 202, I think. But uh, uh, thanks for joining us, uh, Ben, and, and everybody out there in the audience. And we'll see you again soon.